Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 409, uh, featuring the uh, our first episode that will deal with the golden age of computer role-playing games. It was a time of tremendous expansion, uh, tremendous innovation, some of some just brilliantly uh, incredible games that uh, shook up not just uh, the CRPGs, but the entire uh, computer games uh, industry. Truly wonderful time, uh, about from the uh, mid-80s on through the uh, early uh, 90s is about where, where I put this. And some of the games are all over the map, chronologically uh, speaking. Uh, but anyway, I thought it'd be fun, since everybody talks about Ultima and Wizardry, uh, to actually start with the Might and Magic series. Now this is a John Van Canningham's masterpiece uh, franchise. Uh, he gets, we're going to get started here with the uh, first two Might and Magic games that came out in uh, the mid to uh, late 80s. These are a little bit behind uh, those other series I was talking about. And uh, the reason I want to cover these so bad is I think they're really, really wonderful games, uh, but they don't seem to get the attention. You know, everybody's uh, more concerned with these other uh, franchises. But anyway, I think the Might and Magic games are incredible and definitely worth a look today. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Might and Magic 1, The Secret of the Inner Sanctum. Uh, so here we go, folks, and I'm really, really pumped about this episode. You know, these are the, the Might and Magic games uh, to me. It's a really special series for me. I, I got started with the Might and Magic 6. Uh, it was my first Might and Magic, and then I played through uh, all the way through until I think the, the ninth one. Uh, which is kind of a stinker, but we won't go into that one here. Uh, but this is a series that, to me, get, doesn't, it, it, it tends to get overlooked all the time. You know, people will talk about Bard's Tale, uh, Ultima, Wizardry, and all these games from about this time. Uh, but what kills me is that, you know, everybody's talking about uh, Lord British. Uh, they talk about Robert Woodhead, uh, Alan, uh, Andrew Greenberg, you know, Fargo, Heinemann. Uh, you name it, but uh, JVC, the, the great John Van Canningham, uh, you know, to me, he's just right up there uh, at the top of that list. And it's really this uh, Might and Magic series where I think is, uh, uh, I guess this is his biggest series. I don't know if he worked on all that much other stuff, but uh, uh, this is a series that to me gets uh, tends to get overlooked, as I said. is a real shame uh, because it's a extremely well done, uh, huge amount of content labor of love it's it's a lot of fun it holds up well today and i think a lot of that has to do with just the fact that uh, uh jvc or john van canningham he had all these models he could look at uh, so what we're going to see here in this game a little bit of bard's tale a little bit of wizardry a little bit of ultima and of course his own uh, magic <laughs> uh, rolled into this package now, I'm not going to sit here and make out like I like these first two games uh, better than the, uh, the later ones. You know, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but just, I, I, I do think they hold up well. We'll have a lot of fun with them. And they're uh, really easy to get into, uh, to get up and running. It's also, I, I think, one of the reasons this does get overlooked was it came out relatively late. You know, I'm almost tempted to put this into the Silver Age uh, instead of the Golden Age just because of the timing, but... Uh, let's see, this one came out in 86, and the second one comes out in 88, so it looks more like something that would, would have come out two or three years earlier, you know, just looking at it superficially. Uh, so again, it's kind of one of those in-betweener games. Uh, you know, if you want to get uh, fixated on the year of release, you know, he's probably working on this for three or four years before beforehand. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, I think you could get away with putting this in the Silver Age and, and lumping it in there with the uh, the Ultima games we were talking about last time. I'd have no problem with that. Um, but I know some people do worry more about the year and, and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, anyway, let's just get into it. Uh, so you see I'm putting in my characters here. And these games uh, did include a set of pre-made characters. So you could just skip all this and jump straight in. Uh, but you know me, I always like to uh, mess around with my, my characters, create some, uh, find some crazy Matt Chat Ratrions to name them after. But anyway, let's talk about this character creation process. So he is going for that old school dice rolling mechanic. So he's trying to simulate or emulate the, the roll of those die. So we've got, I guess you can get up to 18 in any of these stats. And that's an impressive number of stats. I mean, look at that. Intellect, might, personality, endurance, speed, accuracy, luck. I mean, it's a lot to manage. Uh, the luck and the accuracy and the speed, I believe, those are just kind of uh, secondary stats, I guess you could call them. 
Uh, they determine like the number of uh, the order of attacks and your ability to connect uh, with your weapons. Of course, lock. This is sort of the miscellaneous category, but the other ones go. They're they're tied into the classes. Uh, so, for example, the the warrior, the knight. I think they call it here. Wants might and endurance, uh, which is uh, you know hit points basically. Personality. That's for clerics, and I think uh, uh, paladins use that later on maybe. Intellect, of course, the sorcerer class. Uh, and then the robber, I think the manual says he doesn't really have, or he, <laughs> yeah, he doesn't really have a, uh, a major stat. Uh, so I guess that one's kind of uh, wide open there. Uh, but anyway, what I, was, what I thought was fun about this, you know, as somebody who's uh, crazy about the sixth game in the series, I was surprised to see how much of this original game, some of the mechanics he introduced here, actually. Uh, sticks around all the way through the entire rest of the series. I'll get into that uh, as we go along here. Uh, but the good news is, if you are more familiar with those later ones, uh, it's it's easier to get into these uh, early ones than you might think. All right, so anyway, I've got my crew of miscreants assembled here. <laughs> uh, I tried to put one in each class. I think I succeeded there. And we're into the game, and I mean, already I'm kind of just blown away by the quality of the graphics here. I mean, if you go back and look at the, uh, uh, especially at Calabeth, I mean, you can really see that his, uh, you know, the art style here is, is really uh, top notch. I mean, you guys, <laughs> I can recognize the, what I'm looking at here. Those are torches. You know, obviously the brick walls are nicely uh, done there. Uh, the interface is right on the screen. I love that, so you can see what the buttons do. Uh, if you're looking over there on the right, where it says commands, you need to look up there real quick. Uh, and that was pretty unusual for this. You know, I guess we, he is coming a little bit later, so he can, he's can he got more precedence to follow. But uh, it was nice not having to go to the manual or your quick card every few seconds to see what button to push. And here we already have an encounter, and it is with some sprites. Ah, yes. <laughs> not the soft drink. No, 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 no. We have... Uh, you know, those things look more like garden gnomes to me. I think I'm actually fighting garden gnomes. Uh, but we can see we got a different screen here for the combat. Uh, uh, <laughs> not very graphically exciting. You know, okay. Uh, but it does show me all the information I need to know. Uh, including some kind of behind-the-scenes uh, stuff there. We've got Handicap Monster Plus 4 there. Not even sure what the heck that means. Uh, but... I guess this is probably all explained in those lengthy manuals. You know, I should mention that before I forget about it, too, is that these these are great collector items, uh, the first two Might and Magics. Uh, I guess they all are, really, but the, uh, the first one in particular, you know, I've been on the search for decades now, trying to find a copy, a complete box copy of Might and Magic 1, because he, he puts in all the same sorts of trinkets that Lord British does. He tries to one-up them a little bit. Uh, but I haven't been able to get one, get my hands on one, and I'm not going to spend a thousand dollars on it or whatever. Uh, but anyway, if you do happen to come across one of those in the wild, you definitely want to consider picking it up, because uh, it's, you know, again, everybody knows about Ultima wizardry, etc. Uh, but it's a little harder to find, I think, these um, early uh, might and magic games. I mean, <laughs> just try doing a search for might and magic, and all you find is heroes of might and magic. But, uh, anyway, back uh, back to the game here. So you can see what uh, what I'm having to do here. I'm trying to cast spells, and unfortunately, that means I have to go to the manual. And uh, I really, really wish I had the printed manuals here. I could just have open on my my desk because uh, I'm having to use these PDF files. Try to juggle all that and go <laughs> scroll up and down. Try to find the right pages. You know, I guess somebody smarter than me could just find <laughs> find a way to, to bookmark that information. Uh, but you got the spells uh, for clerics and then the different set of spells for your sorcerers and they come in levels and they're all uh, described in the book. They're all uh, described and numbered in the book. And it's stuff like, uh, well, let's say like level one clerics, awaken, bless, blind, first aid, light, power cure, turn undead. Uh, which, by the way, I'm pretty sure a lot of these spells are, again, maintained all throughout the rest of the series, which is pretty cool. You know, I recognize some of those. I guess if you if you had started with uh, the first few Might and Magics and made your way all the way up to the uh, the sixth game, which is where I started, uh, you would be uh, really really thrilled at all of the uh, uh, the stuff that carried over. 
Uh, but anyway, it is kind of a little bit of a pain because you do have to have some kind of reference open uh, so you can see what the, uh, the spells do. And some of them use gems. Others just use spell points. Uh, so you have to re uh, recover those. But uh, it, it's pretty cool. And I like the... He doesn't follow uh, Lord British. You know, he gets really, really elaborate, really fancy with his uh, spell descriptions and his manuals. <laughs> uh, this manual is fairly clear, fairly uh, utilitarian. You know, just the name of a spell might be First Aid. Uh, it's pretty obvious what that does, right? Uh, one spell point, combat, one monster. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at a different one. Uh, <laughs> object, one character, cats at any time, heals minor battle wounds, restoring eight hit points to that character. Uh, so I like the uh, the clarity of this manual. Um, it is kind of fun reading Lord British's manuals because he does it all in character. Uh, in that medieval sort of style but uh you know then again when you're in the middle of a game you don't really want to have to try to parse <laughs> you know, uh, parse his lexicon or whatever you want to call it uh you just want a quick glance uh, but you can see here we're only fighting really just fighting these uh three sprites and it's it's pretty involved i mean even this first battle uh i guess this is comparable to bard's tale uh, games uh, we'll get into that series here eventually uh, you might have a little bit more control here. You know, obviously, the attack, the, uh, the you know, obviously, it's obvious what that does. The, the fight, though, is interesting. Uh, what that lets you do is pick a different target. So if you didn't want to attack that front line sprite, uh, you could go down, attack somebody else. Um, exchange, you could swap out a, your position in the party. So if you're in the back, you can't use your melee attacks, uh, five and six. Uh, usually what will happen, somebody will get un knocked unconscious, and if you can't heal them, immediately you can try to exchange places with them so you can get up into the front uh, now eventually i would like to have all my characters having uh, ranged weapons uh, that way even in the back you can just be sitting there uh, slinging stones or uh, whatever ranged attacks <laughs> uh, whatever kind of weapons you get access to uh, so for now i got some dead weight uh, back there but they wouldn't you know it wouldn't be like that for the whole game i'm sure that's her up to round six, and I still got one of these sprites left. I really having trouble connecting. I've tried to bless my people. All right, for defeating the monsters, I got some experience points, and I I'm pretty sure in this one I need to hit S and search. Uh, you search the place where you fought the monsters. It doesn't automatically pop the the treasure up there. Uh, let's just see. Uh, so I got no gold starting off here. Uh, this is probably another really good reason to go with that pre-made party. I'm pretty sure they're already equipped with some gold. So I'm being a little bit hard on myself here by creating a new party. But uh, let's just see how hard, how long it takes us to die in this. I understand it's a pretty massive world. Uh, we're here in Sorpagal, which of course you recognize that from Mind Magic 6. I think that's new Sorpagal in that game. But uh, no, no auto mapper, guys. You know this, this is before the age of auto maps. Uh, so you can either break out the old graph paper uh, if you want to go that old school route. Of course, there's plenty of uh, uh, hint books out there. I'm actually was using the uh, one that or uh, uh, New World Computing put out. Uh, they've got their own hint book, and I think I think I told you last time that a lot of these companies actually made more money from their clue books than they did their <laughs> actual games <laughs> just hilarious uh yeah so the uh this is an official new world computing uh, hint book it's by eileen cronin uh, i don't think uh almost like mark carl caldwell actually did some of the graphics in this uh, uh book valuable travel hints insights and mapping provided by john van canning and mark caldwell and benjamin bent uh, so they were involved in the hint book too uh, it's always something if you want that complete experience you know you have to get the manuals the box also if there's an official hint book you want to get that too because the you know give you a little flesh out a bunch of stuff that might not be clear or mentioned at all actually in the game uh, but one negative thing about the, <laughs> these maps uh and the clue book it's just the graph you know it's just showing you walls and doors it doesn't tell you anything about you know what's in the locations and it does talk here in the manual now. I'm not looking at the clue book with the manual. So he's got some tips here on mapping. I just thought it would be fun to uh, to share with you to give you a little bit of the, the flavor of this era. 
Uh, so let's see. He's got s how many tips? Uh, six tips. All right. So see if you guys agree with this. So uh, first, copy and use the blank maps provided. Each blank map is a dot grid, 16 by 16 squares. In area, connect the dots to indicate walls or other obstructions. Leave the dots unconnected to indicate open passageways. Mark the area and level being mapped. Uh, so that's pretty sweet. So uh, I guess it must have included a uh, probably a little tablet, uh, a pad, I guess, of a graph paper that was uh, exact of these coordinates, which, which that's pretty cool. Let's see, second tip. Remember that the 3D screen always shows what your party sees as it looks forward. At first, each stop each time your party moves the square and add the new square shown on the 3D view to your map. All right, uh, three. If you have trouble visualizing your orientation, <laughs> yes, he knows me well. Uh, turn the map when you turn your party. Oh, let me let me let me let me, uh, let me go over this again. So, if you're Matt, <laughs> turn the map when you turn your party. You know, I never thought to do that. <laughs> I think I've discovered my trouble. Oh, my God. Uh, big breakthrough here. Uh, if you turn your party right, then turn your map left. <laughs> I, love the, I love the uh, explanation there. Add the new view shown on the screen to your map before you move again. Uh, four, mark locked doors, secret passageways, dark areas, special features, and messages. Mark areas where you can be sure of encountering monsters, such as the dragon's lair, but don't bother marking every square in which you encounter monsters or treasure. Chances are they'll appear in a different square next time. And then six, uh, for the exact coordinates of the party's location, see sorcerer's spell location. Uh, so I really should have read that. <laughs> A lot of great tips there. Uh, you know, this is one of the reasons I think this game holds up well. I think, you know, probably JVC, uh, he seemed like the kind of guy that was uh, really concerned about the play. Well, I guess what you call something like the player experience. So I'm guessing he's user testing, that play testing this a lot with people, uh, seeing where they're getting stuck and uh, making notes of that and putting it in his uh, manual so that if you actually bother to read the damn thing... Uh, you wouldn't be getting uh, hung up as much. Uh, so I like that. Anyway, let's see. Back to the uh, back to the game here. Still trying to make our way through this uh, uh, this forest. And yeah, it's just a, it's really impressive to me the, the size of this. And this is not procedurally generated uh, land areas. This is all, you know. Like I said, you, you can find maps of these regions. Absolutely huge. Uh, five towns we can go to. Your party of adventure sets out from the inn in one of five towns. The town from which you set out is a town containing your party. Uh, set up your party. Okay. Yeah, I'm just kind of looking over the, the map here. Or <laughs> the, the manual. <laughs> uh, it's great stuff. Uh, but I'll tell you what, though. I've yet to... Get into a lot of combat. I hope there's some uh, something for me to fight out here. Keep thinking when it says "please wait," I'm like that's uh, gonna be a monster. But uh, okay, I'm gonna have to get oriented here. Maybe I should print these maps out and start rotating them. Uh, maybe that would help. There's supposed to be another town here somewhere. You know, it's amazing though. These these mountains just look so much alike. <laughs> there we go. Oh, that's that stupid castle again. God. No, there's a town here. You know, I could have edited this video to make it look like I knew exactly where I was going the whole time. But, <laughs> again, I'm trying to recapture the experience, at least for me, of playing these things. And, uh, and this would have been what it would have been like. It probably would have taken me a very, very, very long time to get to a point where I could just uh, navigate this effortlessly. Uh, but anyway, I've got it narrowed down here. I've got all the maps. I've got them rotated. <laughs> I've got every, every possible uh, visual aid. Oh, there we go. All right, so we're in combat. Uh, thank God. <laughs> I never thought I'd be so happy uh, to run into a random encounter. Well, uh, we got vampire bats, and uh, apparently this is a very important vampire bat because he's got four guards. Wow, it's a very uh, rich bat, I suppose. 
Uh, anyway, let's see. Garmin goes down! Uh, they're all just going down rapidly. Uh, this is a lot easier than I thought it would be. boom -de boom boom uh, Each survivor receives 26. Now I know to search, and I find a cloth sack. And let's see. I think those sacks are trapped. It seemed like just about everything I tried to open was trapped. And uh, we'll see this, if I can remember who my... Uh, my thief is actually unconscious. Uh, it opens! All right, I think we got some, some gold out of that. Pretty cool, but I am look. There we go! Oh. <laughs> the cave! Now, it's dark, uh, but fortunately with this game, uh, we, we got the wizard, the cleric. Uh, they both have these light spells. If I can just remember the, the number, we can get this uh, lit up. Don't have to worry about torches. Let's see. What is the spell for light? Okay, I think it's number six. Boom! There we go. Let there be light. Let there be light. The godlike power of the light spell. Now these walls, I really like the look of those uh, those walls. A lot of detail. You can even see it looks like some algae, <laughs> some fungus. <laughs> uh, you probably wouldn't want to see this uh, this this kind of coloration in your basement, but uh, well, what do we have here? Uh, flesh eaters. We get very nice uh, monster artwork. I kind of wish they would keep the monsters on screen, uh, on this screen. It'd be kind of cool to be able to see them. Uh, but I guess he wanted to have the, save all the real screen real estate for the battle. Okay, fighting these flesh eaters. Wounded. I kind of got to the point now where I can just rapidly go through the the battles. It's not like uh, Bard's Tale where you, you just sort of have to watch everything scroll by. I mean, with this, you the faster you click, the faster it goes through the battle, uh, which I think that's a big plus. You know, sometimes you can read a lot faster than that text can scroll, but, you know, you can try speeding up this text, but then you might miss something. It's just kind of a mess. Uh, with this, you know, you could just do it however fast you wanted to. It's pretty cool. Let's see. Uh, is anybody dead yet? No. Nope. <laughs> uh, the the uh, second game I'll show you gives you a lot better information on the screen. It'll show you the uh, hit points you have left and uh, a little bit more information. Uh, here we just, that little, aster that little star, little asterisk, I think that just means my character's been knocked unconscious. Uh, I can see if I can uh, heal one. My cleric there. Let's see if I can heal up. Uh, yep, so M Lane is back in action. Uh, four points of damage. M goes down again. Damn it, Lane! Damn you! Quit going down. <laughs> Good God, man. Uh, all right, let's see if we can do this again. No, oh, that's, I'm sorry. That's uh, probably, it probably would not improve his condition to hit him with a flaming arrow. Even though he probably deserves that for. Going down. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we rested up. And the nice thing about this game is you got the food, but it's not like you're just constantly eating every step uh, as you do with Ultima. Instead, we use food when we rest. And I don't think it brings you fully back, uh, heals you fully. Um, let's see, does it say there? Uh, but it definitely does a lot. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And I like the fact that you get knocked unconscious. You can just rest to recover. You don't. I'm sure it's possible to die, but uh, at least in my playthrough this time, uh, the worst thing that ever happened to me was getting knocked out. Just rest up and you're back in action. And another cool thing too, if you do happen to wipe, <laughs> as I did, you just uh, return to the temple where you started from. Uh, so JVC, uh, to me, it seems like he's not nearly as uh, punishing, you know, as some of those other games. Uh, you know, it's not like he's holding your hand by any means, but uh, it's not that big a deal. Uh, you you don't feel so, um, you know, like a one wrong move and you, your characters are permanently dead and, and you just have to create new ones and, and start all over. <laughs> I mean, this is uh, a lot more forgiving. You know, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, so, you know, and again, that's one of the things, the reason a lot of people don't like these old games are just too hardcore. Um. Uh, Oh, what the hell happened there? <laughs> well, I guess the 
I guess I mean, that makes sense, right? I broke into a jail cell, picked the lock, got in there, but then when I tried to get out, uh, it was locked. And then when I tried to uh, unlock it, I couldn't and ended up getting hit with a protective spell. So a little touches like that. If, uh... You know, I got to say, though, uh, you know, it just seemed like there's a lot of stuff here where it just, you know, it really looks like there should be something, right? I mean, all these little cells, I mean, you'd think you'd find something in there. Uh, so I guess one criticism you might you might have of this game, yeah, it's it's big, it's massive, it's expansive, but you know a lot of this just seems like uh, you know just empty space, endless corridors. You almost could almost would prefer to have less area to explore and more stuff going on. You know, so I don't know if that's one of the criticisms they um, I gave to this game. You know, and something else too, I've yet to run into that special critter. You know, you know the one I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I keep expecting it, but uh, no. All right, so I think we've probably seen about as much of this as uh, uh, we need to see. I think you get a pretty good taste of uh, what the game would be like. I am kind of getting pumped already, though. You know, you think, I got a little money now. I can go back to town, um, get some better equipment, come back out, explore some more. You know, work, work on my mapping techniques. Uh, so it's already sort of getting, starting to get its hooks into me, uh, which is exciting. Uh, but anyway, let's uh, leave it off here. I want to show you the uh, uh, some of the other versions of this game. And then we'll get into the uh, the second one for a little bit. All right, so here we go with the uh, Might and Magic for the Macintosh, classic Mac. And I always liked uh, the look of these old uh, Mac Classic games there. Uh, there's just something uh, appealing about it to me. I sort of like the look. And of course, this one's going to have the uh, the window-driven interface, which is uh, quite nice. I don't, uh, I'm pretty sure this wasn't ever released for the Amiga or the Atari ST. Just look on your own Moby games. There's a lot of uh, <clears throat> Japanese machines, Commodore, DOS. Uh, we'll take a look at the NES version here after this, but... Uh, this might be the only version of this that has a uh, a nice window <laughs> GUI uh, interface for this. Uh, so that could be a factor. You might actually like to play this uh, Macintosh version. Um, I, I, I really liked it. It's got some cool sound effects, all, the, all these uh, digitized sound effects. Not a lot, but... Uh, hey, I mean, you can hear the little music playing there, right? Uh, so this makes it a lot easier, I think, to... Uh, to see what it is you're buying, you can, obviously with the the Mac they could put more <laughs> windows on there. You know this. You know what this reminds me of is the. If you ever played those, uh, I know I covered a couple in Mad Chat, but the like the Shadow Gates, the Uninvited's, uh, the Deja Vu, uh, that series of adventure games. It, it looked a lot like this. You know, I even got the torches on the wall uh, from Shadow Gates. So, yeah, I could see uh, getting into this one. I'm pretty sure it's an exact copy you know, in terms of the, the areas and the maps and everything. Uh, let's see. A little easier to get around, I think. We could use the mouse or we can use our arrow keys there. Oh, yes. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> the door remains locked. Yeah, so this this is definitely a version you would you might consider if you're look, thinking about what one you'd like to play. You know, if you're brand new to it, obviously if you grew up playing it on a Commodore or whatever, you probably want to go back to that. Uh, but but I think this uh, there's something uh, there's something about this interface to me that's it's so different uh, looking anyway than the other ones. It's almost like a different game. I mean, it's really just that level. Now, of course, even this version doesn't have the uh, the auto map, so you still got that uh, to think about. But it's a little friendlier to me. Now let's just see if we can get into some some combat here. Yeah, but this let me see. This, this is a Macintosh version comes out in. Let's see when is it? It's Might and Magic one and two, so it's actually the first two games included here. This was 1992, uh, so pretty well into the. Let me see if I can get a a year when this first debuted for the Mac. 
Yeah, so it looks like it came out in, uh, for the Mac in 87, and I guess in 92 they went back and combined it into this package. Uh, so this, just looking at the screenshots here, it looks pretty identical. Uh, so I think this is pretty much what you would expect to see. So, uh, 1987, if you had a Mac... Oh, there we go, finally! <laughs> a group of monsters. <laughs> Slither beasts and snakes. And I guess the little check marks there are showing the what's going to attack me. Uh, like those are... It's probably a check mark for in range. All right, so that's good. Looks like these uh, the Spree Maid Party, they're already equipped with ranged weapons. And that's a major plus. Uh, one of the things that seems to me to carry through all the might and magics is you could have a, a melee weapon and a, um, a bow or sling or just some kind of ranged attack. Uh, so the characters in the back, they're not just sitting there having to defend the whole time. You know, everybody can attack. Uh, which uh, is another cool thing. There we go, 104 experience points. So anyway, there's the Mac version. Very, very nice. Let's take a look over at the uh, NES version. All right, so let's take a quick look at this NES version because this one is really, really different. And uh, this is, uh, let's see, 1992, published in America, I guess, by the American Sammy Corporation. And obviously, uh, JVC, I don't think he had anything to do with this. Now uh, this porting, it's uh, got some people listed here, so it had their own uh, pretty extensive team. Looks like a couple of Japanese programmers working on it. Obviously, yeah, you have music, a lot more sound effects, totally different graphics. Uh, Serpigal, uh, welcome to our town, Serpigal. Uh, welcome to our town, Serpigal. <laughs> what is your, what is your name? Uh, okay, gotta try to figure this thing out. What's, what's going on with that? thing on top of the screen, kind of sl it's like a slinky man, just uh, flailing slinkies out of his, out of his sides, it's kind of uh, interesting. <laughs> this town is quite dangerous, go ahead fighters! I don't know what's, the sign above the door reads, you lards find foods, <laughs> go ahead fighters, <laughs> oh yeah, B&B uh, &B blacksmiths, Oh, it's just, you know, it's always to me, it's just, you know, it's just fascinating uh, to look and see how, oh, what is that? Oh my god, they put an auto map in this. This one has an auto mapper. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that might be, a, you know, that might be the deciding factor for a guy like me. You know, if it's got, uh, wow, that's a pretty significant difference. Yes, I mean, that kind of puts this, this into a different category. Uh, let's see. Uh, for the love of God, though, I can't figure out how to equip my stuff. I'm not sure why I've only got six people there. I don't know if I have to create the other ones later on or, or what, what's the deal. <laughs> anyway, make it stop. I'm always, I'm, I suck at the game pads. I never know what the, what button is does what. Let's just see, how do I get out of this menu? Uh, it's definitely set up there where I could have six people. Uh, so clearly, I just need to uh, figure out how to add the other party members. Uh, but anyway, let's get out of this before I go nuts. Okay. <laughs> I just want to see what the combat looks like. Could be a little tricky. I like that music, though. That's, that's good music. In the Serpical Gallery. Locked door. Yeah, see what we're saying. All of this stuff was in the first game. All these plaques where you can, I guess, get a little uh, hint about the gist of our mission. Gotta go to these five towns, find their secrets. You know, last time when I covered Ultima, there was a couple of dudes that uh, put in the comments that they, 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 they had played those on the Nintendo. Like, that's the only versions they had played, and they loved it. I guess that's why they sought the video out. You know, every time I'm playing these, I'm always uh, just struck so much by how different it is than the stuff I'm used to seeing, but sort of the opposite for them. You know, and it seems to me, too, that these translations are... I guess this was probably translated... Sometimes they translate it into Japan and then back into English from the Japanese when they <laughs> bring it uh, for the American Nintendo version. It's kind of weird. How you think they go back to the, the source? It looks like they did go back to the source on these. Oh, and there's our, our fight screen. 
So look, I like that. So this one you can actually see the monster as you're fighting it. Yeah, you know, so I think this is uh, really looking like a quality, a quality port here. I definitely haven't seen anything here I thought was inferior or inferior or didn't like. And so again, I love to hear from you guys that have played all the different versions if, if any such person exists. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody said they liked this NES version the best. But anyway, let's uh, skip ahead a little bit. We'll take a look at the second game in the series, and we'll go back to the Apple II for that. All right, so here we go with Might and Magic Book 2. You can already see an immediate difference. Somebody has learned how to incorporate more graphics. Who could that person be? Could that be JVC? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what when this came out. I think it was So the first one came out in Well it says right there, nineteen eighty eight. So that was the same year Pool of Radiance came out. And the first one came out in eighty six. So it, within those two years you could see just the enormous improvement. I mean my god, look, we've got spinning planets up there. <laughs> and there's two of them. I mean that was a a big deal back in the day, just little stuff like that, so and they got the pages turning. Yeah, he's just showing off at this point. <laughs> he's just showing off. <laughs> uh, but wow, you know, same platform. You know, it's just an Apple II, but a couple years, better pro programming techniques. Uh, they were able to make something this much more uh, visually and musically appealing. It's, you know, it's, it's something I always uh, think about. Uh, when you have a platform that's, been, that's around for so long, like the Apple II or the NES, you know, when you go back and look at the very first games that came out for the system, and then you go and look at the last games that came out, it looks almost like different generations. Like, well, that's a Super Nintendo game, or that must have come out for the uh, Apple uh, 2GS or something. But no, it's just that they, uh, the programmers learn, uh, I guess, little tricks, techniques, ways to compress things. I, I don't know at all. Uh, but, you know, they could just keep on going. And always, the, the fantasy I like to play with is, you know, what if we still had, like, the Apple II? If there never was anything that replaced it. You know, where they just, the programmers just keep getting better and better and better. And maybe, maybe they don't even really need the better hardware, right? I mean, maybe there's enough power uh, that's locked in these devices somewhere. And the people just haven't had enough time to, you know, to figure out how to fully tap into it. It's just kind of fascinating to me uh, to think about that. Uh, but anyway, yeah, this second one, I mean, good God, look at the difference. I mean, these graphics are easily as good as uh, what you'd see in the Bard's Tale series. Uh, who is this guy? Uh, the burly blacksmith Svengard busily shapes a deadly sword in the forge. Do you care to see his work? <laughs> I don't know. He's like a bit of a pinko to me. I, I'm pretty sure this is a communist blacksmith here. Unfortunately, he's not giving me stuff for free. What the hell? Still got to pay gold. Uh, let's see. This is my... Oh, see, those are plus one items. I got a staff, a sickle, a scythe, a, the blowpipe. And a blowpipe. Sling. Uh, so, yeah, this is it's almost giving me goosebumps. I mean, this really reminds me of the Might and Magic 6. I mean, all the same all the same conventions are there, right? You got the... Remember the, the merchants and then they have their special item menu? Uh, it's really just uh, uh, just super cool. I mean, the nostalgia. <laughs> I'm, I'm nostalgic for this game I haven't really ever played. You know, just because I played the later ones, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, but look at it. The interface is nicer. It's more intuitive. Uh, we've got skills, looks like, in this one. It says thievery 0%. Uh, I'm not sure what. I guess it's like the other games, too. We'll probably have to find trainers to learn those other skills. Uh, so, yeah, this guy's got 30% thievery. Uh, so, yeah, this second one is really looking uh, like a pretty clear, uh, uh, you know, a pretty clear uh, improvement on that first one. Now, I did go back and look at some of the reviews uh, for these two, and uh, people didn't, you know, a lot of critics, it wasn't like there was a bunch of critics back then. You know, you just had to, you know, the, the major gaming magazines. And, and of course, uh, Scorpio was there doing reviews. And uh, she just was saying, well, it's not a big enough improvement over the first one. Yada, yada. I don't really know where she was coming from because uh, it looks like a huge improvement to me. You know, maybe she just kind of got a little jaded with all the, uh, 
you know, what was 88? You had Pool Radiance. I don't know where the Bar's Tale series was. Uh, I mean, there's a lot going on. So maybe this kind of got lost in the shuffle. But, man, if all you do is just go from that uh, Might Magic 1 to this directly, I mean, wow. Huge difference. Uh, let's see, Scale Armor, today's specials, nun Nunchakas. <laughs> Got my Nunchucks. That's all I need. Uh, what else do we have there? Identify items. Uh, cudgels. Yeah, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna have to make a point of uh, collecting these. I have to get Might and Magic one and, and two. I mean, it's just kind of, it's kind of chafing me. You know, it's been here on eBay looking at some of these packages uh, where they're selling it, and it looks like I was uh, quite mistaken about uh, some <laughs> things. Uh, so yeah, the first Might and Magic, I guess the. There's a binder release here. It says an original hard-to-find binder release. And it's kind of one of those spiral-bound manuals. And uh, I don't know if this... There's a couple of floppy disks there. Uh, so I don't know. Maybe this was just shrink-wrapped uh, with the binder and uh, the manuals. And it didn't even have a box. Uh, maybe that was the original release. Now, some of the other ones I'm looking at here, they have boxes. And I see a big uh, color printed map. Which would be quite nice. I actually got a couple of those from the later games, but not cloth. Now, don't see any tchotchkes here. <laughs> like little onks or whatever. Uh, so, it might not be quite as uh, collectible as the Ultima series in that regard. At least these first two, but man, still love to have them. Uh, beautiful boxes, a box art, and the manuals and everything. And uh, There's something to be said for a spiral-bound manual. Anyway, back to the game here. So I'm equipping my uh, team here, ready to roll out. Uh, female neutral human archer. Jean Eric, gnome, good gnome cleric. Uh, he was a good gnome. Cassandra, the neutral elf. Kind of evil elf. And so I guess this game lets you have evil characters, no problem. Just stick them in. Let's see, do I have everything equipped? I think we're good to go. I got this guy up there. This one even has day and night cycles. Hey, what's this? The, the slaughtered lamb. A low mumble emerges from the middle of the road crowd. Oh, there's Amber, that sultry waitress. Do you wish to order from our vast selection of drinks? <laughs> By golly, I think I do. I have a reputation for drinking. What is this? Children at 015. Now, okay, guys, if you're in a bar and you're listening to people... You're listening to bar rumors, and they're talking about where, where the children are. You probably want to get out of that place. But anyway, let's drink some orc beer. Great stuff, that orc beer. <laughs> so, yeah, you think the beer would uh, be more of a dwarven thing. But I, I guess orcs, you know, okay. I, I feel like I've, dr I've drunk some orc beer in my day. Let's see what's in this little room. Uh, oh, the Great Outdoors. The Gateway Temple. Yeah, I want to go straight from the bar to the temple. No thanks. Yeah, I'm loving this, uh, uh, the scenery. I mean, the graphics, it's just incredible. Oh! <laughs> yes! <sighs> yes, the second Might and Magic game is way better. <laughs> Vastly superior. Look, not just rats, not just giant rats, not a swamp rat. No, it's a sewer rat. I mean, those are the and look. Look at this. Oh my God! It's 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 it's, it's animated. The eyes, the moving, the whiskers. There's a tail. The tail is not flicking. What? Oh my God! <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I'm nuts. <laughs> I, I've definitely passed that, that. That that I've gone through that gate to another world. <laughs> another world is insanity. <laughs> okay, God, I, I need to see a psychiatrist. There's just something that happens to me when I come across these uh, these rats. I mean, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> can't can't explain it. Cannot explain it. But anyway, we are fighting sewer rats. We've got five of them. A little, little victory diddle. A little, little ditty there. Doo, 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 doo. Yes. 
<laughs> you know, it's, I'm almost kind of sad they're going down so quick. You, know, you kind of want to, kind of want to drag this out and just kind of savor it. You don't want to just. Oh man, JVC. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I think this is probably probably one of the best looking rats of the Silver Age, early Golden Age, whatever you want to call it. I mean, that is really, really well done. You know, and, and for this case, the pink works. You know, it's almost like the Apple II was designed specifically to have an animated rat of this caliber. I mean, phenomenal stuff. And the rat is hurt. I like the fact that it shows you a little status. You notice this one, too. It shows you how many hit points your character, each one of your characters has there. Uh, very handy, very helpful. Go ahead and cast a spell on that rat. Goes down. Oh, yeah. Party won its first battle. My first battle with... Sewer rats, love it! <laughs> Survivor. And that's a generous amount of, of uh, experience points. Yeah, so good God, man. What a brilliant game. What a brilliant game. I mean, wow. I don't know what else I can tell you, man. Uh, <laughs> he's diseased. <laughs> well, I guess I, get, I, I did get a disease from the rat. But, you know, it's, it's a good kind of disease. Uh, let's see, what was that all about uh, a fanciful felda cap fountain flows full as fluttering fairies frolic fastidiously. Flick a farthing? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> oh, well, it's like the V for vendetta, but it's the F for farthing. Fool, you have no farthing to flick. What, what is a farthing, anyway? Is that like a coin, I guess? Unit of currency? Must be some special item. Oh, and then here we have some inept wizards. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> he does look inept. <laughs> Oh my god, look at this guy. Look at those shoes. <laughs> do -do 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 dead. <laughs> oh yeah, no question. No question. Uh, this second game is just a hundred times better. I mean, the first one's not bad, but... I mean, this is one here that I would I would get into this and, and, and want to see it through. I mean, he definitely learned something from that first experience. And see, this time the treasures just pop up. Uh, wooden crate, open it, remove the trap, detect magic, or literally, yeah, leave it. Yeah, let's just leave the treasure. Uh, do you know me? Do you know who's playing this game? For God's sake. Flag <laughs> exploded, though. <laughs> oh, the exploding treasure. Those inept wizards. You know, if they'd have just used that bomb to, on me, they could have killed me. Rest complete, no encounters. Uh, looks like that disease didn't go away, though, and I was just kind of peeked at the manual. That's like a level four or five cleric spell, so I will have to pay. Oh, what's this? <laughs> oh, God, what's this guy? guy with a couple of crutches? What is he supposed to be? Brainless. Brainless one. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> you know, how would you like to respond to that casting call in a CRPG? Yeah, you... Uh, well, you look, you look like you have the kind of mug that would be perfect for this this creature we, we want to put in the game. It's called a brainless one. <laughs> yeah, I want you to pose for that. I will, uh, yeah, thank you. Probably thwack him with my double K in there. Yeah, so this is this is uh, really impressive to me. You know, again, you just never hear, I just never hear much about might and magic. Uh, you know, you hear about Bard's Tale, Wasteland, uh, uh, of course, the Ultimas, the Wizardries, all that stuff. And those are great games, but, I mean, come on. <laughs> like, what does JVC have to do to get your attention, people? I mean, he's a really good uh, designer, very clever, very witty. And this one kind of reminds me a lot of uh, Wasteland, with just, uh, with just the style of humor here. Characters, uh, monsters like brainless ones. And actually, though, if you notice, <laughs> this is actually a tougher fight than I've had so far. And notice, I'm noticing that there's also an option there for quick. You know, I don't know if that automates the combat for you or just speeds up the... You know, if that's like an instant resolve option. You know, maybe if I was powerful enough, I could use that. I think I just might barely survive this fight with these brainless ones. Oh, no. Sure, Vala. What the heck? What are you doing? <laughs> Get off my lawn, you stupid kids! I mean, it looks like that's what he's doing, right? He's uh, one more brainless one. 
So really this is more like a brainless four, brainless five. Shoots brainless one, <laughs> hits him, and he goes down. Yeah, about three, third battle, 436 experience points. So I'm really kicking some ass in this game. I'm doing really good. Yeah, we can just rest up. So, yeah, this is a very, very, very playable game. Uh, so, anyway, I think I'll probably leave it off here. Uh, let me know if you've played these games. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, you know, I, Like I say, I started with the sixth one. Uh, that was the first of these games I really got into. Went back later and played some of the earlier ones, but I don't, definitely haven't been all the way through these. Love to hear your uh, experiences. And I will go ahead and uh, recommend once again my friend over at... Um, CRPG Addict, so that's crpgaddict.blogspot.com, and he's got some really extensive uh, posts about these games. Takes you all the way through it. Uh, it goes in a lot more detail than uh, than I am here. Uh, so here's what he says about uh, Might and Magic One. He says it's the highest of any CRPG so far, even higher than Ultima Four. Uh, this gives me a few pangs, but although I like Ultima 4 better as a story, I admit that I probably like Might, Might and Magic better as a game. Now, see, that's the crucial bit. Uh, this is the fun game. You know, a lot of times uh, people make a bigger deal about the story. It's more fun to talk about the story, more fun to write about the story. It's kind of hard to, to, to do that when you're just talking about gameplay. Uh, but yeah, once you get in here and start kicking around, you have more fun. Uh, so let's see what he says about the second one. Uh, so here he is. He gives the second one 58. He says, that's two points lower than I ranked Might Magic 1. If you want to howl in protest, believe me, I understand. Woo! <laughs> uh, from a purely objective standpoint, it seems like two should be better than one, if only for the graphics. Uh, but honestly, I enjoyed the first game more. I think the quest had more depth. The game was better balanced, and the plot was more original back then. It's still the second highest ranked game in my blog, though, and I did have a lot of fun playing it. Uh, so there you go. I mean, these are, uh, you know, it seems like when people went from one to two, uh, you know, he's not the only one. Like I say, I went back and looked at the old uh, reviews that came out uh, when I was doing Dungeons and Desktops. It's one of the things I always did. And yeah, a lot of it was the same sort of thing. They're like, well, it's too similar to the first one. It's not enough improvement. Uh, you know, all this sort of this sort of stuff. I kind of, you almost wonder maybe they should have released this one first. You know, I like to hear from people that played the second one before they played the first one. Because uh, I think somehow that's uh, tainting their experience somehow, some weird way. Because uh, uh, I, you know, if it was just me, I'd probably want to start with the second one. It probably wouldn't f seem so repetitive. It might be repetitive if you, if you just came off the first one and jumped right into this one. Uh, so that might be something to think about. Uh, but love to hear some other views on this. I mean, uh, just for me, I really, really enjoy the Might Magic series. It looks like uh, CRPG Addict. Uh, he's got some some nitpicky stuff, but I think he's in. I think he would agree. They're very good. I mean, he did give them the highest scores, even compared to say Ultima Four, which is probably uh, that's probably going to make people howl uh, more than anything, right? That's a you know a lot of people put that one as their number one CRPG of all time. Not me, uh, but I certainly think it it's a great game. Uh, but again, you know, maybe we could talk about this too. Uh, just this idea that you could have a really, really fun game and you love playing it, but it's it's not so much fun to write about, not so much fun to talk about, not so much fun to uh, philosophize about. You know, it seems like a lot of the reviews I read of modern games, we we're just talking about the they like to brag about how they've got these dark and twisted themes in there, and your choices matter, and you got all these controversial uh, social themes in there, and all that, and you know that's great stuff. You know, I guess it makes uh, in some people's view that makes the game a lot more sophisticated, a lot more interesting uh, to have that uh, depth in there of story and plot and your meaningful quests, you know, and all this stuff, but I, you know, something about it to me just doesn't ever uh, sit right with me, you know, I, I'm much more concerned with whether a game is fun to play, <laughs> that's like far and away my number one uh, criteria, I put that even above graphics, you know, something like this is uh, a lot more fun to me uh, than some of those so-called, uh, you know, deep, meaningful, uh, significant games that basically amount to <laughs> sitting there reading some kind of overwrought dialogue uh, you know, screen after screen of that 
uh, instead of just going around and, and, and killing skeletons, <laughs> gearing up my guys and checking out some cool uh, areas and, you know, coming up with my own story uh, instead of just reading uh, somebody else's story, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I think that uh, kind of gets at why this Might Magic series, <clears throat> yeah, maybe JVC's not doing anything really... Uh, you know, literary, impressive from a literary angle. Uh, you know, he's not he's not instituting a uh, morality system like uh, Avatar, Quest for Avatar, anything like that. Uh, he's just got something here that's a lot of fun to play. And I'm tired of people uh, making out like that's a bad thing. Now, anyway, <clears throat> let's uh, stop it here. I hope you enjoyed the uh, video. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, whatever it is, love to hear those. Just post them there in the show notes. And I'll uh, see you next time. And that's all <laughs> uh, for this week's episode. I hope you guys uh, enjoyed that. Uh, have a lot of fun with these series. I'm really looking forward to the next few, too. I want to go ahead and uh, probably do... Uh, I don't know if I'm going to go straight into Might and Magic 3 next time. Uh, I mean, there's just so much to, uh, I could do here now that we're into the, the Golden Age. I'm kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you got uh, uh, something you'd really like to see, just let me know. Uh, but I think I might go into uh, Might Magic 3 next time. We'll just have to see. You know, these games keep getting uh, bigger and bigger, and I pretty much have to dedicate an entire episode to them. It doesn't seem right to just look at, you know, 20 minutes of gameplay or whatever uh, to get the full picture. Uh, anyway, as always, I want to thank you, 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 with a extra dollop of thanks for keeping this show going guys it would not be possible without people just like you you know there's no advertisements no annoying uh, commercials i hate those uh not no uh sponsors uh, telling me what this what i can say what games to cover nothing like that it's just uh guys and gals like you that want to see more of these episodes uh contribute a buck uh, two bucks uh, whatever you have uh whatever you think the show's worth to you, <laughs> you know, don't go broke supporting this uh this show i mean come on uh, but anyway, whatever help you can provide, I really appreciate it. It really makes a difference. Also, if you want to uh, tell somebody about the show, maybe you got a Might and Magic fan uh, for a friend, you know, <laughs> you could send them a link to this. Uh, or you could sh uh, put, post it on Facebook, Twitter, what have you. And I do want to remind you, I've got all these uh, uh, Matt Chat coins left. Uh, plenty more left. I'm selling these uh, 25 bucks over on eBay, uh, whatever the shipping cost is to your locale but uh, a lot of these guys have uh, I mean I've been getting a lot of orders for these I don't know how long it's going to last uh, so if you want one you might want to go ahead and buy one because uh, once the once those things are gone uh, they're gone okay I'm not going to not planning to reorder another a batch of those I, I might do another series of coins at some point perhaps uh, we'll see I talked to Robbie about that he's probably be really excited he, he had a great time uh, making these coins but anyway I just I know you would like those uh, so uh, you know, just go to eBay. I'll post a link in the show notes to that, uh, 25 bucks, and you'll be supporting the show that way. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to have some kind of item instead of just donating uh, money. So, you know, if that's you, uh, maybe this is your chance to contribute to the show. Anyway, uh, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> Quite a bit of news, actually. Uh, first up is from good old Stig. And he writes in about this guy, a Tomato. You know, I don't know if I want to say this guy's name on the on the air. You know, some kids. Uh, this is a family-friendly show. But anyway, Tomato uh, something. Uh, anyway, forget about the name. Uh, the point is that somebody has posted a speed run. Uh, it's under 90 minutes. And within this 90 minutes, they go through Fallout 1 two, three, New Vegas, and four. Uh, all of that in under 90 minutes. And I think they have a couple of caveats here. They uh, put it on easy mode. They're taking advantage of a lot of glitches. Apparently, if you play it in Italian, uh, you get some kind of speed boost that way. Uh, anyway, it's pretty fascinating stuff, so thank you, Stig. I'll post a link to that. And then Shane wrote in with several items. Uh, the first is the Code of the Savage RPG. This is a guy named Jeff Jones. 
uh, making a classic style Western RPG that's inspired by the great RPGs of the golden era of gaming, 80s to 90s. Uh, uh, trying to raise $4,000. He's got about uh, $2,300. Just checked it before I posted this video, so that's probably changed by now. Uh, so it looks like he's a little bit more than halfway uh, with this. Uh, but anyway, I think you uh, should look into this game. It's a, I'll just describe it here, or uh, read his description. A tale of vengeance and survival. So you escape a slave ship, and then you find yourself in chains, uh, washed up on the island kingdom of Daneth. You must find your way in a brutal and unforgiving world where nothing is black and white. Uh, so he goes on a little bit in there about how it's got some uh, moral quandaries, and you can be, I guess, a real uh, jerk in this game, and so on and so forth, you know. Uh, whatever. Uh, but I did like this part. I wanted to fixate on this a little bit because uh, I agree uh, with Mr. Jones uh, a thousand percent about what he's saying here. And I'll just read it to you. He says, I think a problem with many of today's RPGs, uh, I wouldn't even say thing, I'd just say no, <laughs> is that they expect you to know and care about their lore and backstory before you even take your first steps. <laughs> Amen, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Oh my god, I mean, that's, that's perfectly put, too. In Code of the Savage, uh, you and the main character are totally new at the Daneth. You don't know, uh, so I don't want you to know the lore and backstory uh, straight away. I want you to discover these things on your own terms as you play the game and interact, and interact with its inhabitants. See, see, that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's, uh, I think he's put it a lot better than I, I like the way he's articulated this. Uh, so it's not that I hate stories and I hate, uh, you know, characters and games. It's just, you know, give me a reason to care about those things before you start dumping all the, all the lore and dialogue. <laughs> you know, and assuming I'm just going to be so fascinated by it, right? Uh, so just for that reason alone, I would support uh, Jeff here in this uh, Code of the Savage RPG. But anyway, go take a look at it. I mean, 4000 bucks, I mean, that's just nothing. Uh, he should probably be asking for two or three times that uh, more realistically, I think. But, you know, I don't, I don't really know his uh, full story here. Uh, but anyway, go check that out. That's Code of the Savage RPG. Maybe I'll even get him on the show. <laughs> nice to have somebody on that would agree with me on those, those points. But uh, we'll see. Uh, and then finally, if you want to hear more... Well, i got two more items. So, <laughs> so not fine. Penultimately, uh, I was on Shane Plays, uh, Shane Plays Radio. Uh, you guys know him, Mr. Stax. Uh, and he had Lori and Corey Cole on. Uh, Quest for Glory developers, obviously. Uh, they're talking there about their Hero U Rogue, uh, Rogue to Redemption game came up, I guess, a couple weeks ago now. Uh, anyway, we talk a lot about that. We also get into the Quest for Glory series. We talk about that transition for, uh, to 3D and some of the problems with those later or with that last uh, Quest for uh, Glory game, sort of what went wrong there. It's kind of inside baseball type stuff there. Uh, I, I think it's a really great discussion. Uh, you can check that out over there. I'll post a link uh, to the podcast. And then this is the final bit of news. Uh, so Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire. Uh, I love that game. <laughs> Had some problems, but overall really enjoyed it. Uh, anyway, they're, they're going to have a free update, Beast of Winter. I'll just read a little bit here from the announcement. That's going to be, the update to 2.0 brings challenges that will test your metal in unique and interesting ways. Of course, uh, also with bug fixes. It has a deck of many things, which appears to be a merchant ship with unique, unique items for sale. Uh, it's free. Uh, expansion includes new areas, dungeons, creatures, items, a powerful new item called trinkets. <laughs> you know, a trinket to me doesn't sound like a powerful new item. Sounds like a trinket, but uh, anyway. And a new sidekick named Vatnir. Uh, it's built for level 14 to 15 parties, but will but it will scale to parties of any level. <laughs> yes, it will scale to your level, guys. I know some people don't like that. Uh, <laughs> uh, it can be purchased separately or as part of the Pillars of Eternity 2 Season Pass. So is it free? Is it not free? Uh, apparently it can be purchased. So maybe I'm missing part of the... Uh... Oh, okay. Uh, so I messed up there. Uh, so it's an important update and an expansion. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, update's free, the expansion I guess you have to pay for, uh, but I'm sure it's well worth it. You know, it amazes me, uh, I was just playing those Neverwinter Nights games again, you know, and it's, it's always, I always like it when the expansions turn out to be better uh, than the original campaign, which I would say that's the case uh, for Neverwinter Nights, although uh, your mileage may vary. 
All right, uh, I need to wet my whistle. Uh, so what about that ale of the week? Oh, well, funny you should ask that. I've got a stone woot stout here. <laughs> and the bottle art on this is uh, fantastic. You know, and uh, apparently a lot of people collect bottles. Uh, you know, I didn't realize that. I've just been throwing away all these bottles and, and cans and things, but uh, some of these are meant to be collected. I'm sure this one is one of those. So it's like a limited run, and there are people that I guess at some point might pay you big money uh, for these bottles. They're probably more interested in the older ones, but uh, nevertheless, you know, if you like collecting stuff like I do, it might give you an additional reason to, you know, branch out and try some new uh, brews. Maybe you just want the bottle. Uh, anyway, this uh, what's cool about this is by Drew Curtis and Will Wheaton and uh, Greg Koch. It stones a farking Wheaton Woot Stout, and I'll just read you the what they put here: a mind-blowing al amalgamation of flavors. Front and center this year is a resort, uh, result of Will's creative machinations, taking the art direction duties with world-renowned fantasy artist Joe Jusco. Uh, so apparently this guy's a renowned uh, fantasy artist. That's pretty, that's, you know, how awesome is that? Awesome. Uh, representing our gargoyles' triumph over the evils in the world of beer. And that is a very evil place sometimes. Uh, six years into this amazing Wootstout legacy, and I continue to be stunned and humbled by the response of fans. Sure, it's an amazingly delicious specialty imperial stout, partially inspired by the Kentucky Derby pie of Drew's home state. And speaking of Drew, <laughs> we ask him to lean into two of his strengths, drinking Woot Stout and chatting up a storm. So this year, he'll MC a wildly nerd nominous celebration of beer and geekery known as HopCon Woot Stout. <laughs> oh my God, does that sound awesome? A party held annually during San Diego's Comic Con. The nerd lives in all of us. Celebrate it. <laughs> Uh, now is the golden age for us lovers of awesome things. We're here, we're vast, we've got great taste. This beer is an ode to you, fellow nerd. So, this is apparently a beer for nerds. It's got 11.5% alcohol by volume, so certainly on the higher end. Ale brewed with pecans, wheat, and rye, one quarter aged in bourbon barrels. I mean, that just sounds utterly fantastic. You know, Will Wheaton, he's actually... I'm actually kind of uh, connected to him. He read Dungeons and Desktops, posted a little uh, blurb about it on Twitter back in the day. Probably sold more copies from that one little tweet uh, <laughs> than all the other efforts combined to get the word out about that book. Maybe he'll like the uh, Dungeons and Desktops 2.0 even more. Uh, but anyway, let's get... It probably depends on how I uh, review his Woot Stout. Uh, anyway, let's get this uh, Woot Stout open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this uh, Stone Woot Stout. <sighs> ah, man, that smells good. <laughs> In this rather excellent drinking word. Man, I'm starting to feel a little lightheaded just by... Uh, uh, just by smelling, it smells amazing. You really smell that hops. You smell that bourbon, that sort of smoky uh, bourbon barrel flavor. Uh, what else did they say they had in there? Apricots or pecans or something? I don't really smell any anything like that. I'm a little bit stopped up, but I can certainly smell that sort of cherry, uh, sort of coffee-like flavor of, a, of that bourbon barrel uh, process. <laughs> it smells exactly what you'd expect uh, from a Russian Imperial Stout. Uh, anyway, let's give it a taste. I will say, though, it's, it's, if you look at the color there, I mean, this is just jet black. It hardly has any uh, head on it. You know, sometimes these things might foam up or sometimes they don't have any uh, uh, foam at all. This one is very um, stable, I guess, very thick, uh, which might, may or may not be a good sign. I guess we'll see how that correlates to a flavor. Let's give it a taste. Oh, yeah, this one's it's very, very sweet. Uh, uh, yeah, a, lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff going on there all at once. Uh, you sort of taste the cherry, that uh, bourbon flavor. Uh, maybe just a little bit of smokiness, but uh, mostly just tasting the hops and that, that sort of bourbon flavor. Uh, there's something underlying it, though. Not exactly sure what kind of hops they used uh, for this, but it's uh, actually very drinkable, very smooth. You know, sometimes these things can just... <laughs> You know, make you cough. Uh, this one, on the other hand, just goes uh, right down, very smooth and sweet. Let me try it again. Yeah, you know, this one, 
Uh, there's no bitterness. A little bit of a coffee, chocolatey flavor there. I'm trying to remember what else they said they put in here. Uh, what did they say? It was uh, pecans or something? Yeah, pecans, wheat, and rye. I'm not really tasting anything that tastes like a pecan to me. Uh, I do taste uh, that uh, uh, the bourbon flavor, the cherry, probably more than anything. It really tastes kind of like maybe a, a one of the better flavored coffees, I guess I would probably describe this as. I'll try it one more time here. Yeah, just delicious. I mean, extremely, extremely smooth. Uh, uh, no unpleasant uh, fumes or aftertaste on this. Uh, really, you just get that really nice, pronounced uh, uh, Russian Imperial Stout flavor. Uh, with the with the definitely you can definitely tell it's been aged in bourbon barrels, uh, which I like. Uh, anyway, this is a pretty pretty near perfect as far as I'm concerned. You know, I'd be happy to drink this uh, <laughs> for a long time. Uh, it's, you know, if you could find this, it's not too probably not too hard to find the Stone Woot Stout. Uh, I think you'd really enjoy this. So I'm gonna go full five out of five drinking horns on it. You know, it, it's one of the better uh, Russian Imperial Stouts I've had just in terms of uh, smoothness, uh, drinkability. Uh, it's just a really, really good beer. And hopefully I get Will Wheaton to uh, <laughs> give Dungeons and Desktops 2.0 his uh, honest assessment as well. <laughs> anyway, let's wrap it up uh, with a quotation. And I was looking for quotes uh, about magic. And I found this one by Michael Stackpole. That's a name you're probably familiar with if you watch this show. Uh, and I just, I just really love this quotation. And it really got me uh, thinking... Uh, because these uh, Might and Magic games are called uh, Book 1 and Book 2, so they're kind of, uh, I guess, JBC kind of conceived of them as books. Uh, so this quote is even more uh, apropos. <laughs> it goes something like this. Few and far between are the books you'll cherish, returning to them time and time again to revisit old friends, relive old happiness, and recapture the magic of that first read. So ponder on that and see you guys next time. I'm your court-appointed theatrical agent.